All right, so what I'm gonna be working on now is a slab platter with a coil slash thrown foot. So I rolled out my slab. I do a little bit more than a quarter inch, which is what I'm used to. A uh, quarter inch is the thickness of a ruler or a paint stick. But I rolled this out a little bit thicker than that. And I cheated, I used a slab roller. Uh, some people, once they place this on there, you wanna get as much or you wanna utilize as much clay as possible. So I try to get it as centered as I can. The plaster mold or the hump mold underneath, I put that on the wheel first and got that as centered as possible. So the, the plaster mold is pretty well centered. The clay, not exactly uh, where I want it just yet. I mean, it's a place where I want it, but I wanna put some pressure down as I go around, make sure it's semi-flat before I cut some excess off. Um, I've seen people use a paint roller, like a, just a dry paint roller, and they roll over this. Um, I'm gonna show another way to compensate for that after I cut off some of this excess. You can see most of my excess is on this side here. And I don't wanna leave too many handprints because I don't want too much to have to clean up. But I wanna make sure it's compressed onto here. And double check as I spin. And the reason I'm sitting off the wheel is because this plaster mold is too big. It's about, uh, I think it's 22 inches all the way across. Um, I know the slab at its longest point across this way was 18 inches. So my bowl is going to be a minimum of 18 inches while it's wet. Obviously it'll shrink once it starts to dry. So now I want to trim off some of this excess. Don't use a needle tool on this plaster mold. It'll cut straight into the plaster mold. Uh, my plaster mold here is UG1 uh, that I purchased from my local clay place. But I don't want to cut into that mold because I don't want to have to remake the molds all the time and spend extra money. So I'm going to find a spot where I'm close to getting most of it. So right here I'm just going to hold still. Okay, I move just a little bit which is okay because this is my first cut. I just want to make sure I don't knock my plaster mold off here. take that excess off so this first one it's kind of a rough ride as I try to get a straight line because I'm not cutting in every spot there's some spots where there was no clay so it kind of does this little catch and release catch and release thing uh, normally I would use this um, as my coil which we'll get to in a minute and you'll see what I mean in just a second but I do want to try to cut that line nice and straight so you can see this side is probably my highest side. I'm mean, going to end up having to cut about that high just because I have that little divot there. So I'm going to get some decent speed on here. And I'm, this time I'm going to brace because I know I'm trying to make my final cut here. At least I'm hoping so. Okay, once I hear that hissing sound, I know I'm all the way through. I'll stop my wheel. Make a small incision to get rid of this clay. This I could also add to my coil pile. So before I even think about doing a foot here, I want to clean this up. Not just my outside edge, but the whole thing. So I'm going to take my sponge first to the edge, and I'm going to compress back down to the mold. So not only am I holding two fingers here in the sponge, but also my ring finger down here. And this plaster will absorb some of the moisture. So I'm not really too uh, sparse with my, my adding of water. But I also don't want this to dry too unevenly at the end once I throw the top on, or the foot, what is to be the bottom. So this is the part where I talked about they could use a paint roller. But you don't have to. Any handprints I may have made, I can start out here, work my way up. This actually gives it kind of a thrown look. In this video, I'm going to do in parts. I'm not sure if I'll release them on YouTube in uh, separate parts, like a part one, part two, part three. Because I'm going to do the foot. Uh, later, I'll show you how to get decorative with the foot. 
that'll be part two for sure. And then I may flip it over and show how to do some slip trailing designs. And I'll explain the slip and all that stuff when that time comes. So I've made it up to about here. I'm still going a little too much water. So again, this is not only cleaning it up, but it kind of gives me that thrown look because we get a little bit of throwing lines, but it also compresses it to the plaster mold, the hump mold. Okay, and I'm going to do that one more time. So I do it on the way up, and then I also do it on the way down. Um, you could also do this with your rib. So I'll show you really quickly with the rib, and then I'll go back to my throwing lines, just because I like the throwing lines for aesthetics. But you want to compress just a little bit. This will help prevent warping and cracking. A platter this big does have a tendency to warp. I don't get uh, much issues with cracking unless um, I use an alternative clay body. Like if I used a porcelain slip on the inside, then I do tend to get some cracking, which is somewhat expected. And almost intentional sometimes. I'm going to add water all the way up this time. And now I'll just go into stride with my throwing lines. I'm going to kind of dig in this time, which will slow my wheel down more. But I want those throwing lines. Now, some people would get um, somewhat worried about the centering or lack thereof on this piece. As long as wherever I have it set, I cut it there and it would push you out and make it uncomfortable if it was too far off. But um, if I draw my circle where my foot would be right now, now that I've cut this as, as long as the plaster mold didn't move, this is my center point because I sat here and I cut and made it nice and, and circular. And now I'm going to make a line to where I want my foot. And this has nothing to do with the aesthetics here. This has purely to do with the coil foot that I'm going to add. As usual, a piece this big, you don't want a foot that's a little tiny foot. You want something that's out far enough, but is also elegant looking. So this was that scrap clay I was talking about earlier. I could roll this into a decent little coil and I'd wrap around here, but I am going to use one that's pre-rolled, easy bake oven style. So I am going to score this. Okay, just a little bit. Go across those patterns. coil just a little bit. I'm going to cut off two ends just to make it somewhat square. I don't think it'll fit exactly right that way, but we're going to find out in the middle or in a minute. Cut that a little bit better. Okay. I'm going to score this. This technically I'm throwing on there so it doesn't have to be scored and slipped as well as usual as if you were say sticking on a handle or a nose but just to be in the sake of habit so I got a little bit of slip down here in the bottom which is mostly water okay now I'm gonna set my coil down this thing's huge right now it's about say an inch and a quarter thick, so it's pretty big. Okay, I guessed almost enough. Luckily I am going to squeeze this in. And I'm going to end up cutting some of this off as well. This is a bit much for now. Now that I've got those semi-joined, I've got a little donut on there and I'll just give you the, the once over at a 360. So now I want to make sure that it's in more of a circle. So 
I'm just going to slowly spin, push in where I need it. I just kind of lucked out and got pretty close. Doesn't usually happen that cleanly. Let's see if the rest of the video goes that way. Okay. So now I'm going to take my modeling tool. Let me spin it one more time just for. Yeah, right there is a little off. Okay. So now I'm going to take my modeling tool and I'm going to blend downward as I spin. And this will all get blended, so don't worry about uh, being super, super clean, but also, as you see, I went back to a spot. I just want to make sure that it's dragged down fairly evenly from my coil. And the reason it's so thick is because I'm going to do some decorative things with it, and I'll, I'll uh, end up cutting some of it down. Now I'm doing the inside just to blend. The blending here is more for security or integrity of the clay. I'm going to go over with the finger real quick. Okay. And now it's pretty much like throwing. So I'm going to go in there, smooth out the inside. So it starts pretty rough. I could take a ball of clay, center it, and try to throw it, but I find that it compresses the bottom too much and it leaves like a dent and it just doesn't come out very clean. So I do the coil and thrown portion. So first I'm going to get it basically re-centered. This is also, I've got my fingers inside, my fingers outside. Just getting this clay pushed in there, into the piece. And this is the part that probably takes the longest, is just getting this nice and clean. I've got a big chunk over here that I'm going to get rid of early. And I don't want to make a huge mess off of the wheel since I don't have any trays or anything. But I do need to get some moisture on there so that my hands slide. I'm just going to a little bit closer. So now I'm not really using my fingertips, that's just because my hands relaxed. I'm using the heel of my hand the top of my thumb or the base of my thumb on the top of the clay and then my middle finger on the inside and this will only this will blend and not only that but it also helped me get this thing recentered I'm already to the point out here where I have a little too much water Let this go a few turns. So I get as I want to utilize as much of that clay as possible, but I am going to inevitably end up cutting some of that off. So I'm going to recenter, get as much on there as I can, and then I'll pull up a little bit and I'll level it off. So this is the part where I talked about where I don't just throw a ball of clay on here, center it and throw it because I dig into the bottom of this thing too much. So here with the coil I don't find that I dig in as much. Okay, I'll probably do that one or two more times. Getting some of the water off. Smooth out the inside. The inside's a little rougher than the outside, even though we got that little blip down there. Then when I'm cleaning out here, I try to make sure that I don't move. So I'm bracing myself against my leg. I'm going to 
tiny bit of movement, I guess it's okay, but I want to do as little as possible. semi pole just using my thumbnail to get rid of a little excess there so now just a slight pull I still want this to be fairly thick and you'll see when I get to decorating the foot uh, why I do that a little bit of moisture in there okay, so now Really, it's not so much a pull, it's more to get everything just sort of squared away and even on the way up. And then the only part that'll be left uneven, at least semi-uneven, is the top. And so that part, I'll cut nice and level. But I do want this to be about three quarters of an inch thick. It can be a little less, a little more artistic freedom or license. So right there is where I kind of have to let go because it's already too thin. Right at the top, like right there. Okay. So now I'm going to level it by just cutting off as little as possible. Okay, once I'm all the way through, lift it off. Save my scraps. So now I've got the rough work done and now it's time to clean up. I won't do the decorating yet because I need to wait till this gets a little harder. Still, I want it on the wet side because I'm going to end up squishing the clay into a few shapes. got really into these platters um, visually or just as a fan from uh, oh, what's his first name Mr. Sperry I can't remember his first name I know there's some sons afterwards but I believe it's Robert Sperry um, they were featured at Amoca on a wall that are really really cool and then a friend of mine Sam Lopez uh, taught me how to do this while he was teaching at a community college and loved it ever since and been making them. Um, I've actually made a few of these for uh, friends, customers, and so on. Okay, so that's pretty thick. And I'll check my view or my perspective on the camera in just a minute to make sure you get a good view of the top part. Um, so now I'm going to do a little spiral on the inside. It not only compensates for some parts that are not as clean, but it adds a nice little aesthetic. And then I'm going to redo my lines all the way up, just to make it look like it's a little bit more uniform. could accentuate this, um, you, you, I mean when you look at it you know this part's separate, but I could make a little line like this, clean that up with a sponge, uh, if I don't want that line at all and I want it to look like it, or at least pretend that it's all flush in one piece, uh, that way people, some people like to camouflage what they've done. Just personal taste or personal preference. So it's pretty much done in phase one here. Just double checking everything. So at this point, I would want to delay my drying. I don't want it to dry too fast. So I would leave this out maybe an hour, bag it, Next day, open it in the morning, leave it out an hour or two, uh, maybe three at the most, depending on the temperature outside. But that is phase one of the 
platter with a thrown foot, or a slab platter with a thrown foot. So now I'll give you that perspective I was talking about on the inside. Okay, just a little spiral, but nice and clean. And phase two will be decorating. So phase two of the slab platter with thrown foot or coil tooth thrown foot is to decorate the foot itself. I've let this dry uh, about an hour and a half, maybe hour and 45 minutes. And uh, the only thing I added off camera was this little ridge right here. Um, I wish I would have caught it on camera. I just wasn't thinking. I looked at it and thought I, it'd be a nice aesthetic. So I took a wet sponge, squeezed with my two fingers here, just that crease between the two fingers is what created that line. And the markings I have on top are simply a ruler taken like this all the way across and these are just my guidelines so I put it across and then I look to make sure this is one of the many reasons I like to do that little spiral but it tells me exactly where the middle of this piece is uh, the spiral I showed just a few minutes ago um, but I take this I make sure it's across the middle and I make six lines you can make two four six eight whatever and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these as my guidelines. So I have a total of three, six, eight lines. And I'm going to go in between those, which will create six different smashings, if you will. Um, you can even take, sometimes I take an X-Acto blade and cut these out. Uh, it takes off some weight. But I also sometimes am of the mind and want to waste clay. So I'm going to hold this wheel still so it doesn't spin on me. And in between these lines, I'm going to take a dowel. I've taken a large dowel sometimes, a small dowel. These are just closet dowels from Home Depot, which we also use for rolling pins. Um, I've used uh, little triangle shaped ones. And you'll see more what I mean when I show you. But you push them down and it, it creates a nice aesthetic on the foot. So I'm going to put this on. And I'm going to lean in. Where I want it. And I used to get as overly uh, detailed as putting a level on this, but I find that sometimes even my wheels aren't level to the to the floor. And I try to get this in a one-shot deal. I don't have to put it back on there. So just a little bit more. And then I twist the dowel. If you have a triangle, it's a little bit easier. Uh, sometimes I do this when it's soaking wet as well. And I'll just put paper towels down. Now I need to gauge and make sure I like what I'm doing. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to look at it from a distance, make sure I want it somewhat farther down. Oops. Again, twist and out. And my last one, going from line to line here. Somewhat equal. Again, it's handmade, so I'm not trying to be perfect, but I do want to get it as precise as I can. Just a little bit more. Okay. And looking at it, it's cracking slightly, which I can clean up with a sponge. Um, so I should have done it when it's a little bit more wet, but I'm okay with it. And now you can sort of see, I'll show you up close in just a second. I'm just gonna double check, make sure everything's good, but you can see why I did that two finger thing. It smashes down nicely. Okay, everything looks pretty good. 
once over. So at this point, I'm gonna let it firm up even more and enter another decorative area. Sometimes I'll cut small triangles out in here. Um, even if I don't do this type of foot with the smashing, I might cut a triangle out and smash it down. And again, I use the ruler to get my little symmetric parts. But I will cut it out, press it down instead of doing this part. But I always do um, something pressed in so that way I can glaze these parts. I can't glaze the foot that it's going to sit on, which is this outer edge here. And I'll get you a little more detailed in just a second, but one more last little detail that I'll do later is I'll probably cut some holes out right here. I have a little brass pipe or a straw and I'll cut like one large one here and two small here and try to make those as symmetric as possible. So I'll give you the view from the top at this point. So you can see the pattern I followed and what it looks like up close. Okay, so that's phase two of the decorating on the foot portion of the platter. All right, so the last phase of this uh, slab platter with a coil to throne or coil and throne foot is either clean up on the inside or in this case, instead of cleaning it up, I'm going to use a, a slip. So I'm gonna pour some slip in here and do some slip trailing. I'm not doing slip trailing from like an ooze bottle or anything like that. I'm going to do it with my rib. I just think it's an easier and more aesthetically pleasing way to clean up the inside because this was the plaster mold. So it was upside down before. Um, I, after decorating the foot and getting every, everything solidified and letting it get to leather hard, um, then I flip that mold and it should just come right off. If it doesn't come right off, sometimes I'll take a modeling tool um, just to the edge and give it another half hour or so and it should pop right off. This one popped off pretty cleanly. I do have this fairly well centered. I'm just gonna double check. Sometimes I'll intentionally leave these uncentered for slip trailing just so that my spiral or whatever I'm doing isn't right in the middle, but I am gonna get this a little better centered. And I use a smooth rib to do some of this slip trailing. Uh, sometimes on the inside because it has hardened and that plaster does absorb some of the moisture, um, it's hard to calculate the even drying, which can sometimes lead to cracking in the foot um, because the difference between the platter, which is fairly thin, and the foot, uh, which is a little bit thick, uh, you have to dry it sort of slowly. So I bag, unbag, bag, unbag um, over the course of a day and a half. Um, but I want to make sure that this is still leather hard, a little bit beyond leather hard because I am going to initiate some more moisture to it, but I also don't want it to be where it starts to get that white chalky look. Uh, if it does get that white chalky look, usually it leads to cracking between or the contrast between the two drying stages of adding soak and wet slip to a fairly bone or close to bone dry piece. So this is still all fairly moist, still pretty firm. I could probably lift it by the lip, but I won't because I don't want to break it. Uh, but I am going to add some slip and then I'll do some trails with some ribs. Normally I scoop this in with my hand and then I just rinse my hands off. But for the sake of the video, I'm going to use a cup. Now this slip, normally I use a contrasting slip, black mountain, uh, some sort of iron based or um, stained slip. I use porcelain sometimes if I want some cracking or uh, B-Mix if I want a white, really white, or I guess B-Mix is more of a gray, but uh, a whiter or lighter colored slip in here for contrast. This is actually the first time I've ever used the same clay body slip inside of this and it's LBM or Long Beach Minus Iron from Aardvark. But I'm going to do the same exact slip inside and I'm just testing this out and most of you won't even see that until later but I'm going to scoop some of this slip up the slip I want to make sure it's super super clean or super um, blended so I used an immersion blender 
And I also added a flocculant. And the flocculant I used is magnesium sulfate. Sounds fancy, but just some Epsom salt. Okay, so just a bag of Epsom salt. I used about two, uh, I'd say two tablespoons, which is kind of a lot, but I want this to hold peaks. So opposite of deflocculant, like say Darvon 7 or vinegar, like distilled vinegar, uh, that would break up the particles and make it more loose, which helps you mix your slip a little better and help, helps it break down. But in this case, I want it to hold peaks like whipped cream. So I used uh, magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt. And this is probably a gallon or so of slip. That's what I'm gonna put a bit, quite a bit in the middle. That might be enough, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna add a little bit more. Yeah, I just blended with an immersion blender. Um, I've seen people use putty knives for this phase as well. But there's a little bit of slip. Now I'm gonna use a rib, and I have a bunch of different ribs. Um, standard metal rib, you could use a wooden rib. Sometimes the wooden ones are really nice for spreading this out. I have some with uh, little textures or like little designs on them, which I'll probably use that one. And I never land this the first try, just FYI. A little rubber rib, this one's a softer one, a little mud tools rib that I also got from Aardvark. Um, sometimes I'll use the corner of a rib, which this one I just cut off with uh, wire cutters. So first I'm gonna spread this slip out. Don't wanna leave it on there too long. So I'm just gonna take my rib, Already, I'm not even trying for a design, but you're seeing the little spiral effect going. Okay, still got a bunch on there. So that right there, you could potentially stop. I'd hope you'd clean up the rim. But I'm still spreading some of this slip out. I was thinking when I laid it down that it might be a bit much. Um, but now it's looking more like it's not quite enough. But I might be able to get the rest of it out there. So yeah, I'm gonna add just a little bit more slip. And again, this is just purely the clay body. I let some scraps dry from trimming. Um, but just the clay body, water, and then that flocculent magnesium sulfate. Now I'm going to spread that out because I do want this slip to be somewhat thick. I don't want it to be too close to the layer of clay, but I also don't want too much because then my platter will have a tendency to not only warp, uh, but it may collapse as well. And when it comes to the actual design, once I get this spread out, um, like I said, it almost never happens exactly right on the first try. I usually sit here, I'd like to think that I get it done in the second or third try, but it's usually more along the lines of fourth or fifth try. And there is a point where you kind of want to uh, call it quits. I shouldn't say quit, but just stop before you get too far. Sometimes you'll get a decent pattern and you decide to do it one more time and then you thin it out too much. So this should be my last, if not second to last, drag across the body as soon as I fill that little gap in there. Right there, I almost bottomed out. I don't want to take the slip all the way to the bottom. I might add a little bit more slip now that I bottomed out. Okay, that amount of slip is usually what is left on there. There's no real avoiding that. I try to get it all on the bowl, but there's always going to be a little bit that's not going to make it. So I'm gonna try it at this point with the design. I'm gonna clean up the lip just slightly. I'm gonna end up messing this up again anyways, but I'm gonna put that back on the, or in the bowl. Clean up the 
bottom in case it slips off on the bottom because I can't see underneath it where I'm at right now. So again, I can use any number of things. Um, I'll just kind of show you briefly and then I'll have to clean it up again. But I could take this. And that would make a nice little stuttered pattern like that. And I'm going to have to add some more slip now that I'm showing some examples. So right now I'm just getting back to square one. The cleanliness. Fairly flat. Um, I might try this. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to go because I've never tried it in this fashion. I've tried it on other pieces or like mugs and things, but... Yeah, I could definitely uh, sew onto something, but I don't like it, personally. So I'm just going to do regular rib, but I am going to put a little bit more slip in there and even this all out. Right now we're tinkering or teetering on too much slip. But I'm going to flatten this all out again. Start from square one. So what I intend to do or what I have in my mind, we'll see how it goes, is the um, little spaced out like conch shell or um, I'm trying to remember what the name is of the, um, the golden rule if you will. Uh, like I said, I could leave it as a spiral but I'm going to use the rounded side here. And I'm going to go slow this time. Okay, and that is a little closer to what I'm, I'm aiming for. The uh, shell that I was talking about is the Fibonacci's um, law or rule of that precise calculations in nature that just sort of naturally occur, but it's Fibonacci, that's, I couldn't think of who it was. So I'm going to flatten that back out again, we're going to do it again. Okay. I actually kind of like the way it looks now. If the slip didn't shrink so much, I would leave something like this. Sometimes it just happens by accident, but it does shrink so much that you wouldn't really even see this on the piece. So um, I'm going to get a little bit more slip on the lip. And whenever you want it in a place, because I am working from inside to out, I need to put it a little before where I want it. swipe here from inside to out just to get it somewhat flat. Yeah, there's so many different uh, things you can do. Like the Sperry pieces I saw and I talked about at Amoka. Um, a lot of his stuff that he did with spirals, I'm not exactly sure how he accomplished it, but um, his were off-centered so that the spiral would start somewhere over here and end up on the outside, um, kind of going off the edge, which I really liked. Okay, getting that slightly off the bottom or the edge. Okay. Um, all right, let's give this one more shot here. Like I said, never landed the first try. So 
So that phase, I do like this. Um, I like the way the peaks held up. They're kind of sharp. They'll pull up some glazes, do all kinds of interesting things. Um, I do need to clean up that outside edge somehow. So we're going to try this. thing is I don't want the peaks at the edge. So I'm going to smooth those out ever so slightly without pushing slip downwards into my pattern. Alright, I think that is good. Of course I'm going to test that theory a few more times, see if I can mess it up. <laughs> Typical uh, creativity in mind or a potter go until it goes too far yeah I like that quite a bit I think I'm satisfied with that so now I'm gonna let this stiffen up probably I'd say an hour and a half depending on what the weather's like outside which today it's raining and it's kind of cold so I'm gonna let that stiffen up a bit um, and then I want to bag it to sort of distribute the moisture, sort of a greenhouse thing, but I don't want to touch my slips. I want this to harden up a little bit. And in the end, this will be way less dramatic than it looks now. This will all kind of fold in a little bit. Um, that Again, that flocculant helps me hold those peaks, so those pockets will stay, but they'll thin out quite a bit because the slip is going to shrink like clay always does. Um, which again is why it's so important to get this slip on there when it's leather hard but you uh, don't want it to be bone dry because it'll crack and so many other things, but also you don't want it too wet uh, because it will collapse on you. I've seen these collapse. I've seen these wilt in different sides. Um, you don't want too, too much slip in there. One, it will make for a, a slightly uneven surface, but even if that's what you want, there's so much moisture in that slip that it'll absorb into the rest of your piece, which either leads to cracking or collapsing again. So. That is the last portion of the slab platter.